Hey everybody, welcome to episode 391 and a half, the Experimental Aviation Special. In this week's show, Matt and my lovely wife Megan, we are speaking with Joe Caraggio. Joe Caraggio has been an airline pilot for a major, major legacy carrier, we're going to call him Acme Red, White and Blue in the United States for over a decade. He's also a Reno Air Race pilot, an experimental aircraft builder, a coordinator for the Experimental Aircraft Association's Air Venture Cup, and an owner of a Lance Air Legacy, a Long Easy, and a weird contraption, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Joe, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Armando. Yeah, thanks for doing this. This was, uh, I was talking to Joe a little bit earlier, and last week we did a story on the Air Race Classic, and I said, who better to talk to this week about the Air Venture Cup than Joe Caraggio? Also joining us, Megan. Meg, how are you? Great. Can't complain. Excited to be here and to see a familiar face. Uh, is, that, among, is that me? Among the regular familiar faces. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen your face in like a week, babe. She's happy uh, referring to me. She was happy to see me. Yeah, it's really I'm excited. It's I'm a little bit. happy to see Joe. I'm wearing Joe's shirt, so. Oh, well, not Joe's shirt. We're going to talk uh, about well, Joe's uh, yeah. merchandise that he's selling a little bit later from this race team. Uh, this is going to be a all great show. very complicated. <laughs> Matt is experimental back here. Aircraft, experimental host. Yeah. 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 yeah, Matt is back there with us also. How you doing, Matt? Yeah, I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank you. As I say, it's the third time lucky with the intro. As I say, I basically... This is why I don't do the intro, I should stress. This is why Carlos always does the intro. Because I screw it up every single no, time. No, this is perfect. <laughs> you guys are in for a good show. Matt is back there pushing the buttons. John is uh, actively talking into our ears. So if you hear us pause, it's going to be the usual. Huh? <laughs> uh, lovely guest host tonight. And Joe... A uh, little bit of inside baseball. Joe, Megan, and I all know each other. We've been uh, at Reno and working out there for, I don't know, a couple years now since Joe came out uh, before he was a rookie. And we've actually flown together a couple times, too. So I had a death-defying experience flying with Joe this year at Reno. Um, <laughs> if you guys I'm remember... Like everybody I, who flies with me. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, it wasn't Joe's fault. Uh, it actually, Joe was gracious enough to take me up on a training ride. And uh, it was after that ride that I said, no, thanks. You guys can keep this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Not exactly in those words, but. <laughs> yeah. There were other different, uh, other words of choice used uh, that day. But uh, hey, let's go around the horn a little bit. Matt, what have you been up to this week? Uh, not a lot, really. I've been a little bit poorly the last couple of days, so I've sort of been sort of struggling, sort of basically working and then immediately going to bed. That's essentially what's been happening the last couple of days. But uh, yeah, just, just working, basically. It's uh, peak for the company that I work for, so it's all about getting wine delivered at the moment in time for Christmas. Ah, well, it must be slowed down because I do not have my wine here in the middle of Missouri with me. So right. Okay. It must be yes. backordered. Yes, that, that's true. Yes. So, although the, there is a, there is a, a, a company, the company I work for do exist in the states as well. So, I had no yeah. idea that the 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 rules around alcohol in the U.S. and having it mal delivered was so complicated. It's yep, absolutely... it is the United States of America. Each state has its own rule. And, yes, <laughs> you know, it just makes it just makes it hard ship to ship wine across the border. No, of each no, state. Yeah. no, absolutely. First, first world problems, right? I um, know, I know, right. right. <laughs> Speaking of that, coming to us from Arizona, Joe, what have you been up to the last couple uh, months now since uh, Reno? Yeah, I've been doing a lot of flying. Um, I uh, had my nephew down in uh, Phoenix. I still flight instruct, and he's developing an interest in aviation, so we're kind of trying to foster that a little bit. Um, finally getting back to work on uh, making some parts for the Defiant and then uh, working a lot, too. So it's, you know, I got kind of six months between the uh, Pylon Racing School and Reno being done that it's really flying focused, and I don't get a lot of time to get other stuff done, but trying to get back to that stuff now. So. Oh, that's good. Um, speaking of flying with people, we're going to get to this a little bit later when you're pushing your social media. But if you go to rampratracing.com, there is actually a function in there that you can actually request to fly with Joe, where Joe is passing his uh, love of aviation on to anybody that wants to uh, essentially chip in for gas, <laughs> probably. <laughs> yeah, every little yep. helps, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, Megan, what have you been up to this week? 
I haven't seen you. Uh, well, since you've been gone, I mean, laundry and dishes and childcare <laughs> and, you know, caring for the dogs. I have no help this week. It's been really awful. Um, but otherwise, you know, just, just live in life and doing my own thing because I don't have a, I don't have a husband to feed and take care of. <laughs> is he really demanding, Megan? Is he really demanding? He's really demanding. Yeah, so it's a nice break this week to have the house to myself and I get to watch whatever TV I want to watch and... You know, it's well, nice. Only what, one what? child to take care of. Yeah, only the one only child. Only one yeah. child to take care of. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I was gonna say, come on, be honest. Who who is more demanding out of the out of the two children the you dogs. care for? It's oh, the dogs. The All dogs. right. No, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the dogs. Yeah. That was not the answer I was hoping for. I know. <laughs> I'm being honest. <laughs> oh dear. Well, uh, John, how are you? Okay, good chat. Lovely. Anyways. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we got a we got a thumbs up, Matt. We've had uh, people in the chat room. I am going to give the prize this week to Richard Adams and Lee Davies, who I checked. I was checking up my setup uh, a couple hours before this and and way before the show started that they were in the chat room already chatting with each other. Oh, my other, goodness. So. <laughs> wow. Do you, do you happen what to have the win? chat room up? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I don't, but I'm sure... Uh... I'm sure we can do something about that. Uh, well, how about Megan? How about you run us through who's in the chat room? Because I know you're in there. Sure. Yeah, we've uh, we've got a, a somebody named Carlos Stebbings. Yeah, the name, do we know the, the, Carlos the, the, Stebbings? The name does vaguely ring a bell. Yeah. Um, he hates London, apparently. Right. And um, <laughs> uh, I don't know what what valuable insights he'll be able to give us, but he's there. Right. Um, we've got okay. Nick Codling. Here with us, we've got Masha, we've got Tony S, we've got Shuttle Pod One from Arkansas. Oh wow! Uh, we've got let's see who else. Richard Adams, you mentioned Evan Shu, John Jester, Matt C. You know, and the usual usual folks in here. Awesome. Well, uh, I'll tell you what. If you are not on YouTube and you want to join us live each week. Um, if you're listening to the audio version, this is uh, the way to do it. You can join us uh, at uh, 1900 UTC on YouTube. It's where we record. You can hit, you know, it's the YouTube world. So hit like and subscribe and uh, get <laughs> notified when we are recording new episodes. But hey, guys, uh, enough about all that. How about we start talking to Joe about his career and his uh, love of aviation? What do you guys think? Absolutely. All right. So, like I said, I know Joe. I know. If we should make T-shirts that say that, um, I know Joe. Uh, but I've known Joe now for a couple years. Megan's uh, also known Joe for a couple years. Joe. So, first of all, I'm sitting here at uh, in Studio 320 at uh, the Marriott Studios here in Chillicothe, Missouri, <laughs> which is lovely Midwest. You are just around the corner in Brookfield, Wisconsin, where you grew up. Right. I am. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'm uh, visiting mom and the rest of the family this weekend. So back now, a couple of miles from where I learned to fly. So tell us a little bit about that. You you grew up there. Is it, did you come up from an aviation family? I know you worked at uh, a local airport as a lineman. How how did that influence your your flying? Well, I um, started uh, uh, flying when I was twelve. And my very first exposure to aviation was a uh, airplane ride that I distant relative down in Tucson, Arizona, actually in a barren. Um, I was, man, I had to have been I was in the third grade, whatever you are there, 11 or 12 or something like that. Um, went for an airplane ride and um, it was, I'm the youngest of six kids. Nobody in our immediate family flies. And so I went um, for an airplane with, with my cousin and it was in a barren. So with the pilot, plus the six of us, we uh, put me on the, in the middle in the front seat. And after takeoff, my cousin uh, or distant relative gave me the um, flight controls and I went not give them back until we were just about ready to land. And ever since then I've been hooked on airplanes. So that's really what, what got me started. Well, that's pretty cool. Like having a flight in a barren as your first flight, that's uh man, it was all downhill from there, huh? <laughs> right. Now, yeah, was, tell me, growing up, what what would you say was your most memorable moment? Well, I mean, the, I guess you you kind of have to say your first solo flight, right? Um, yeah, I started flying when 
when I was 12. And so I had to wait for four years in order to solo an airplane. Um, so I got to solo, uh, do my first solo flight on my 16th birthday at the hometown airport here, Capitol Drive Airport in Brookfield, Wisconsin. Um, and uh, it was kind of one of those things that, you know, I had to wait for my age to catch up with my experience in the flight training I had gotten at that point. So uh, luckily we have a uh, really neat airport community here. Um, the uh, There was an aviation day camp at Capitol Drive, so I did that for a couple of years. Um, through that, I met some friends at the uh, local airport as well in the EAA chapter, um, and they invited me to come out and hang out at the airport. So pretty much from the time I was in middle school through um, moving away to college uh, every Saturday and Sunday during the school year. Um, and more than that, during the summers, I would be out at the airport mowing the grass runway, uh, refueling airplanes, helping the mechanics, you know, pretty much sitting there begging for airplane rides or anything I could do to be around them. So, so Joe, you said that you were flying from like 12 were you working as a lineman mm -hmm. at the airport at 12? Uh, well, not officially. <laughs> I was hanging oh, okay. out at the airport. Um, there must be some different child labor laws airport. in the Midwest. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. The, uh, the very first uh, vehicle that I learned to, to drive was a uh, pneumatic assist Mack fuel truck with 12,000 gallons of fuel on board. Um, so that was, nice. that was the vehicle that I learned to drive. Um, so I, I pretty much cut my teeth on, you know, in multiple dis different aspects out at the airport, starting from the age of 12. Wow. That's amazing. So this wasn't, it's almost like this was, this was what you were meant to do. And it just like, what else were you supposed to do there? I mean, you were constantly around aviation. You were wanting to, to hop on airplanes with anybody who would let you on. And this didn't come from your family. This was just something that you were really passionate about from a very young age. That's really cool. Yeah, I was very fortunate to find people that um, not only took their time, but also um, shared their airplanes and resources with me to, to foster my interest in aviation. So, and, and as part of that, I was certainly a Young Eagle. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the Young Eagles program. Um, I was given my Young Eagles ride during one of those aviation day camps. Uh, at Capitol Drive. So I'm a second generation Young Eagle. The guy that gave me my Young Eagle ride um, was in probably the first couple of thousand Young Eagles to, to go through the program. Um, and now anybody that I give Young Eagle rides to, which I still do to this day, uh, they are third generation Young Eagles, which I think is really cool and a testament to the value of the program and the, um, and, and the, the, the community that chooses to share and pass forward their love of aviation. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, we, uh, this is kind of a free flow conversation. Um, so it sounds like you've had an, an, a relationship with the EAA from a pretty young age. Um, what, how would you say, so obviously they gave you your first, your first flights and, and you're still passing that on. What, what would you like to see yourself you know, accomplish in, in EAA and, and if it's with young Eagles or air venture or or any of those things? What What is it that Joe Caraggio wants to do for the EAA community? Well, you know, I think just um, help support the people that are currently in it and help grow it. Um, yeah, the uh, aviation is a relatively small niche community, uh, but it's made up of some of the best people that I've ever had the privilege to spend time with, work with, fly with. Uh, um, and I, I really would like to foster that community, see it grow. Um, there's a ton of, of young eagles that um, I've been able to interact with both on the ground and as their pilot. Um, some of my young eagles have gone on to get flight training um, and are working towards pilot certificates and things of that nature. Um, so I think that's really important. I think um, the uh, Air Venture Cup is another thing that's really important for the community. It's a, you know, one of my, com not complaints, but one of the, the things that I think the aviation community is lacking is giving people a purpose to fly. You know. 50, 60, 70 years ago, airplanes weren't commonplace. A lot of people may never have been on an airliner at that point. But nowadays, air travel is pretty much normal. People associate aviation with the airliner that they get in the back of and, you know, watch a movie and they're at vacation by the time the movie's done. Um, the awe of aviation isn't there quite as much with the younger generation anymore. And I think 
it's really important for us as pilots and people who care about the aviation community to to tell people what they can do once they get their license, to give them an example, to show them, to, to, to give them the fun of soaring and formation flying, racing, aerobatics, um, you know, going out into the back country and, and landing a seaplane on the water and, and going fishing or swimming, um, you know, giving them all, all the, the reason why it is important to become a pilot and find that that passion in them something that we can spark in them so i'd i'd really like to see um some focus on that what was your passion aviation um pretty much all of it <laughs> um i want to fly all the things i want to i want to get all the ratings i want to um, have all the experiences and for me it's about experience and some people poo poo the the guy that wants to go out and fly every different type of airplane or, or chases type ratings or chases um certificates and ratings and things like that. And I get it. If you're doing it just to, to put a merit badge on the wall, um, yeah, that, that isn't me. What I do it for is for the experience. Um, last year, um, during COVID, one of our fellow sport class racers who's actually been on the show, John Van Hatton, um, called me up and asked for a place to stay because he was going to go and get a, a, a glider rating in lieu of doing a flight review. Um, his whole thing is he doesn't ever want to do a flight review he wants to do an additional rating and for his skill set and learn more um, instead of just going and doing the minimum for the flight review um, and when he found out that that he was doing that I said well you certainly have a place to stay but can I invite myself along with because I've always wanted to do that and it'll be more fun to do it together than do it by ourselves and so um, I uh, joined him for the uh, for the uh, glider rating and that was a ton of fun. Um, so, yeah, you know, for me, it's all about the experiences, about the camaraderie with the people, about the education and, and learning and, and growing my skill set as well. Um, so, yeah, I can't give you an answer when you ask me what it is for me. I mean, racing certainly one of them. Uh, formation flying is certainly one of them. Um, but just sharing the joy of aviation and, and what is available to other people, that's, that is as much as one of them as, as anything else. I love flight instructing. I still actively flight instruct over 100 hours a year. Um, which doesn't sound like a lot as a flight instructor, but considering I have a full-time career in aviation plus the 200 and 250 hours or so I fly my own airplanes a year, um, it's kind of hard to fit that all in, but I'm so uh, excited about it. I try really hard to. I'm, I'm actually going to put Megan on the spot. So M Meg, listening to Joe talk about this community in in aviation or this aviation community, including everybody that's listening to us and everybody in our chat room, everybody that supports the show. Now, the three of us briefly got to meet up at uh, Air Venture, EA Venture in Oshkosh in 2019, I believe it was, um, or was it 2018? I can't remember. Uh, I think it was 2019. It was yeah. It was, yeah. It was 19. So what are your observations listening to to Joe talk about this community and uh, how it's so niche, but at the same time, we we all come together to spread the word of aviation. What are your what are your thoughts on that? It is niche, but it's very inclusive. It's not an exclusive kind of community. It's very much let's pass on knowledge to the people who want it. Let's pass on knowledge to the next generation. Let's make sure that we include a diverse population of people within the community to ensure that everybody can be raised up. You know, it's a really inclusive uh, and, and educationally focused and safety focused. I mean, at least the people that we know, uh, it's very positive. It's very, very, everybody that I've met seems to be very cool. Also, I think that's a prerequisite. Like you just have to be cool to fly an airplane. I think, I don't know. <laughs> um, but also the, the, the circles that we kind of run in are, these race pilots and <laughs> you know uh these people that that kind of do the extremes ac uh, aerobatics and and things like that so i think that's a special breed of pilot um but as it relates to you joe i was looking through your bio on your website and i was just thinking how in the world does he have time for all of this stuff like you literally just fly all the time at any moment's notice and work on flying and work on airplanes and educate people on flying. And like, that's your whole world. But how do you fit all of these things in? Cause you do so much with aviation. It's, it's a challenge. Um, yeah, unfortunately, well, fortunately I'm, I'm blessed to be able to, to participate in so many different aspects, but it makes it really hard to spend a lot of time. So, um, 
for example, I, I talked a little bit earlier, there's about six months of the year where I just really have to be focused on Air Venture Cup, PRS, uh, Reno, um, and that leaves me about six months of the year to do maintenance and airplane building. So I kind of have to shelve the, the building and, um, and other activities for that six months of the year. And, and compartmentalizing is really the only way to go about doing it. And the other thing is, is I'd be remiss if I didn't say that I have a ton of people who are more than generous to help me out. Um, I've got friends that come and help me work on airplanes, friends that help me make sure that um, our race team has the uh, the merchandise and the websites and the videos and things like that. So um, I have not met a more generous group of people um, than I have in aviation and, and how they help support uh, the endeavors that I um uh, have chosen to pursue um, and and really the majority of the people that uh, participate in that are doing it because they enjoy aviation and enjoy being a part of it too. Um, so I think it's really neat to have that group. Now, yeah, that's you, really great. Now you're talking uh, about building. You mentioned that a couple of times. So tell me a little bit about, so it seems like you've kind of stuck to experimental aircraft and, and experimental amateur built aircraft. What, what is it about that, that, well, I guess, explain to our audience, what's different about experimental aircraft, as opposed to certified aircraft, as opposed to like what you fly for work. Um, so like, what's different about experimental aircraft? And then, and then what is it about that, that attracts you to, to this community? So the uh, experimental amateur built category of airplanes is um, an air, uh, it's an airplane that was at least 51% built by an amateur, uh, meaning it wasn't built professionally in a factory. Um, and it's a category of airplane that is uh, designed for education and recreation so that people like myself and all the people that, all the airplane builders that came before us, Paul Pobrezny, uh, founder of EAA, um, and a whole slew of, of really well-known people, um, it, it's a, a way for them to be able to build something or come up with unique ideas build it in their garage and actually go out and fly it. Um, I don't want to say it's not, it's, it's not regulated, but it is less regulated than a certified airplane. It's rest, less regulated than an airplane that, you know, John Q public can go to the uh, dealership, if you will, or the, or the uh, airport and go punch down their check and, um, you know, go and, and buy an airplane, you know, for the, for somebody that's going and buying an airplane, there's a, a set of certification standards that the airplane has to meet. Um, and then same thing with airliners, which the, the bar is much higher for those as well. So essentially the experimental amateur built airplanes are, are something that it can either be built from plans or a kit. Um, and then you go out, you, you build it, it gets inspected by a representative or the FAA. And then you go out and do a flight test program um, to prove that the airplane is safe. Now, so we've we're... got a video playing out. Yeah. And I, I know you were probably going to say something uh, intelligent about Armando. I'm just like, what the heck is this airplane? <laughs> it looks nope, really that's what cool. I was gonna say. Also... Oh, what the okay. heck is what this airplane? Is this airplane? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? And so also, that... uh, what are these things? Are, these are not like handholds, are they? Because that would be a little insane. <laughs> Those are actually uh, camera mounts there. Okay. Um, <laughs> so they're and they're mounted to the rollover structure of the headrest there. Um, but that's uh, my airplane that I affectionately call Betty, and uh, it's a highly modified Rutan Long Easy, um, and I actually call it the Garaggio Easy is what it's officially registered as, uh, because I have changed the plan so much that there's no way, shape, or form that Burt Rutan should be responsible for anything that comes of that airplane uh, from a liability <laughs> standpoint, because uh, there's probably about 75 different modifications to that airplane where I deviated from the plans. Um, it's a, a really unique airplane, uh, pretty fast. Uh, it's 195 knots running wide open on 170 horsepower. Um, and, uh, it's been flying for about six years now. So uh, did, wow. where did, now you're an engineer, right? Well, I, I went to school for aerospace engineering. Um, I have never actually practiced engineering as a professional. <laughs> As a, only as an amateur. As a professional, right. <laughs> exactly. I would say this builder. is practicing engineering, right? Like this is, you've essentially created your own airplane. I mean, this sounds a bit like me because it's like everybody says, oh, you're really good at doing lots of things. As a, yeah, in reality, I'm a, you know, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. That's, that's the problem with me. <laughs> and, and that's how I feel too. And a lot of what I do is, is what I call R&D and I throw that from somebody to rip off and duplicate. So, <laughs> yeah, the... Uh, um, I'd like to take credit for 
you know, all of the uh, advances that are in, in Betty. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is there's a, a wonderful community of people that share their, their information and especially their safety related information and how to, how to build a better mousetrap as it refers to long easies, right? Um, and so um, I've leaned on that community heavily and they've been wonderful in, in sharing what they've learned, like most uh, aviation groups are. So Betty is kind of the, the culmination of all of the good things that I've seen, or all of, all of my favorite things that I've seen in the, uh, in the canard world. Canard referring to the, type, the category of airplane that's got the small forward wing in the front, that's called a canard, which is the French word for duck. Um, <laughs> but uh, in the canard world, um, you know, the um, innovation has been rampant and I took all of my favorite things that these people have shared and put it into this airplane, so. So Tony S in the chat asks a question that I was also just thinking about. Uh, can you take us through the process of self building and how does this actually happen? Does this get delivered to you in pieces? Do you put it all together? Um, and then what challenges do you face in building an airplane yourself? The answer to the question is yes to all of those. Um, <laughs> there are multiple different wow. ways to How many build an pieces? external airplane. <laughs> so a lot. Um, it's, and, the, and the common um, analogy is it's kind of like building an ele or, uh, eating an elephant. You, you know, you have to eat it one bite at a time, and there's lots of bites. Um, so there's a, a bunch of different ways to build a experimental amateur built airplane. Um, some of the more common ways are through kits. So you can you know find online a kit manufacturer that builds an airplane or pieces of an airplane for which you want to make another copy. So the uh, Vans Aircraft, uh, Lance Air, Glass Air, Glass Star, Panther, uh, uh, Sonics, you know, those are all examples of, of kit manufacturers that will basically build you a really cool adult erector set and you spend a couple of years or decades working on putting it together and then you go strap yourself in it and light the rocket and go and see if it flies. Um, <laughs> Sounds fun. Yeah. The, <laughs> and it's a ton of fun. Um, there's another way to do it is plans built. There's a bunch of airplanes that were developed in plan form only. Um, a lot of those are more um, original home built or, or antique home built. Like the Pete and Pole uh, is an early example of that. The Baby Ace is an early example of that. And you buy a set of plans. You buy raw materials, whether it's um, chromoly steel tubing or a roll of fiberglass and a couple hunks of foam. Um, some spruce, whatever the case may be. And then you make all the little bits and pieces from the plans and then you assemble the bits and pieces to assemblies and then you put the assemblies together and make an airplane. Um, so that would be another way. Um, and then you can also actually design your own airplane um, and come up with the plans yourself and do everything from, you know, soup to nuts on your own airplane, your own design um, and, and come up with what you would like to see in an airplane. So really there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, the, uh, the common theme in all of that is, is a determination and passion to do it and see it through. Uh, it's a long-term project. Uh, building Betty uh, was an estimated 4,000 man hours over eight and a half years. Um, wow. And I had a bunch of people help me build that airplane. Um, yeah, RVs and some of the other uh, more refined kits uh, they advertise, you know, some kits advertise anything from 650 to, to 2,000 hours worth of work. Um, you know, as in everything in aviation, take that times two and add 20%, you might be somewhere close. Um, <laughs> but uh, it is it is certainly a, a commitment for not only you, but also your family, spouses. Um, you know, life gets in the way, and it's something that you have to be able to set aside every once in a while and then and come back to, and your, your passion and determination will bring you back to the project and see it through the completion. Or run away so, from your family to take a respite and yeah. work on the airplane. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, what, oh, when, I first, that too. <laughs> when I first met Megan, um, she jumped into the Lancer. <laughs> and I think knowing... Looking back on it, I think it was a crazy move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was never Got lost on an airplane with Armando or the Lancer? Yeah, both. The Lancer. Yeah. Like that, so I'd never <laughs> flown in a private airplane before. And then the very first one that I jumped into is what Armando lovingly calls a Sucrets box on wings. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, it, it was never lost on me that it was built by a dentist in his garage in also New Jersey. Also that, so. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, actually, uh, so I mean, one of the things that, that that's fascinating for me here is, uh, uh, I mean, I'm my role, if you like, in in this particular podcast is that I am a very nervous flyer. Uh, at one point, I wouldn't fly, and now I do. But I, it's one of those things that I'm just not comfortable with at all. And the the thing that sort of you know, it's sort of like a commercial aircraft, you know, whether it be Boeing or Airbus or whichever, whichever, you know, there are McDonnell Douglas, you know, there's all sorts of different aircrafts and stuff, but there's procedures in place and, and protocols, if you like, that are, uh, cleverly closely monitored and followed and all that kind of thing that generates the aircraft that everybody gets in and flies away i mean that must i guess that what i'm saying here is that must be quite the leap of faith if that's something that you've like essentially built from scratch from plans that you've either designed or or taken off the shelf or whatever but you're essentially you and your little team are the people putting the nuts and bolts together to build that aircraft i mean is there a moment that goes through your head when you sit in that cockpit for the first time that just makes you think, what am I doing? <laughs> it's, it's funny you, you ask that because um, the answer is yes. Um, I remember, so the first flight for Betty um, happened in early November in a suburb of Minneapolis. Um, as you can imagine, it was pretty cold up there. Um, and uh, where the hangar was that we were taxiing from to the active runway was probably a 15-minute taxi or so. Um, and you know, I had a pretty good team built up around me, a, a chase plane. Um, in fact, the guy that gave me my young Eagle ride, um, who also was my flight instructor through my private and is the uh, chairman of the air venture cup and has served a bunch of roles in my aviation journey, um, was up there as, as the uh, flight test director for me. Um, and I had a written procedure written out with, um, all of the different roles and responsibilities and, and what we were planning to do, what we weren't planning on doing, uh, what the weather needed to be, and all of those kinds of things were very well defined. Uh, and, and me being the pilot, I had a very defined role and was pretty busy until I had 15 minutes of taxing to the active runway. And all I had to do was keep the airplane going straight, which is pretty easy, right? Um, <laughs> so during that time period, there was a, there was a moment in my head where I'm like, Oh my God, Joe, what are you doing? Are you nuts? Um, and, uh, and I, it wasn't exactly that vocabulary, but, um, the, <laughs> the gist of the, yeah. of the conversation that I had internally was, was exactly that. Yeah. Um, uh, family and, show, ladies and gentlemen, family show, please. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I, and luckily for me, the taxi was only 15 minutes, not 20 minutes, because by the time I got to the run-up area, all of that was out of my head. I was very mission-oriented, um, and it was, okay, go through the checklist, go through the procedures, be ready, think about um, uh, contingency planning, things like that. And then when there was no reason left not to fly, we went into um, I mean, I so, spe- yeah, I there suppose- actually is. I was going to say, on the flip side to that, though, you know, that is that, as I say, it's almost like that, like, like that leap of faith. But, I mean, you guys wouldn't be doing this if you didn't understand aircraft, I guess, in the first place. So, I mean, you, you must have a rough idea what is likely and unlikely to work, as an example. But also, once, once you do do that run on the runway and you get yourself airborne for the very first time, that must be the most amazing feeling it, with something that you've created. You know, at that point, you're still so busy and so mission oriented <laughs> that that there yeah. there is no feeling at that point, or at least there wasn't for me. Um, when the the when that feeling and that uh, rush of emotion came was when I shut down the engine because uh, at the at the hangar because then the job was over. Um, we had committed aviation for our first time in Betty, and everything went well, and we were there to talk about it. Um, and and so that's when that happened, but. You know, getting airborne, I mean, I, I've i got GoPro videos and stuff of it, and I think you can pretty much see in the GoPro video, it's just completely business um, for the, the duration of that flight. Yeah, and I will attest to that. Every time that I've flown with you, it's, it's business. Like, you guys have such a unique approach to aviation. Or like Megan was saying, we, we tend to surround ourselves with, with, with professional pilots, uh, in professional in the, in the sense that, they're race pilots. There's a lot of trust that happens there. Um, it is very much 
business only. And sometimes that can be a challenge when you're at Reno and you're surrounded by family and friends. And we'll get into Reno a little bit later, but but uh, I know flying with you and I see you, I see you when you when you put on the flight suit in the hangar and and you switch your shoes and it's time to go. It's like, like you... social mode versus go mode. And it's yeah. just an instant like we've seen it in George Catalano also because we've known George for years and he's like our surrogate, I don't know, flying father or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but he's, father. Ve- father he's very George fun. Will start calling him that. Yeah. Father, yeah. <laughs> like, is it, is it like fun. Yeah, it's, it's like Godfather and, only, like yeah. Yeah. Fly, the Fly Father coming out <laughs> before yeah, Top Gun yeah. Two. Quite absolutely. <laughs> At this rate, yes, absolutely. Yeah. But he's, he's got that very obvious shift in demeanor where everything is light and fun, and he's talking to the fans at Reno, and then suddenly when it's time to go, like he's very focused and very serious and. I mean, there's just nothing else that could go on that would distract him from flying this airplane safely. Shall we? Uh, Shall we go through some of the questions? Well, we just a... have some great questions in the um, chat room. Uh, yeah, there's there's one. Um, uh, well, Carlos is asking, what is insurance like for experimental aircraft compared to certified aircraft? So um, it, it depends. Uh, insurance is um, one of those things that's on the rise right now. Um, everybody's insurance rates has go- have gone up. Um, it depends on the, the particular type of airplane you're talking about. Um, yeah, one of the most popular kinds of, of experimental airplanes is the Vans RV series. Um, and the Vans RV series is actually cheaper than a lot of certified airplanes to insure. Um, and really what it all comes down to is a... Um, is for the insurance uh, carriers to have an acceptable risk pool to spread that that liability or that potential cost out over. Um, and with having 10,000 or 12,000, however many Vans RVs there are out there right now, um, that's a, a, a statistically valid a wide range of, of airplanes that they can spread that risk out over. Um, when it comes to something like uh, Lancer Legacy that I use for racing, uh, insurance is pretty astronomical. Um, it can be, I have to count all the digits, one, two, three, four, five. It, it can be a five-digit number oh, wow. to insure that airplane if you want to insure it for more than just liability only. Um, so it depends. It's not necessarily the fact that they're experimental airplanes. Um, it's more so uh, what the accident history of that type of airplane is and what the risk pool is. So if you're going to build your own one-off kind of airplane, you're probably not going to find reasonably priced insurance for it. Um, but if you're going to build something that there's 12,000 copies of out there, you're probably going to find some decent insurance. So, oh, I mean, you, you mentioned that you sort of you sort of teased there the uh, sort of like uh, insuring liability only. I mean, is is that quite commonplace? Is just literally uh, insuring for liability only, especially when you're racing and things like that? Just literally in case you hit something, essentially. Yeah, you know, the um, everybody has their own financial situation and their own risk tolerance. Um, I uh, I had the airplane fully insured for a while, um, and the uh, insurance over the last two years has more than doubled. Um, wow. So, uh, unfortunately, we're down to liability only insurance on the airplane. Um, I'd love I'd love to be able to fully cover it, but we're in a financial position where. Um, it's not a, a deal breaker for us to go racing if if we don't have it covered. Yeah. Now I, so, I will add I will add there you know because when I when I had the Lancer 360, while the insurance may be higher than some other aircraft, you there are significant cost savings um, in other areas. Um, for example, avionics. Some of the experimental aircraft avionics available out there are just as capable if not more so than certified aircraft avionics at uh i don't know joe what would you say a a third to half of the cost yeah it's easily a third of the cost i mean if you were to go out and put a g1000 in an old 172 you know it's going to cost you 100 grand Uh, if you go and put some of the now stc to avionics um that that had their origin as experimental avionics but now you can put into an airplane like a 172 you're looking at more like 30. Um, so it's a it's a huge savings um, in in parts it's a huge savings in maintenance um, and servicing and things like that so uh, plus the performance is better I mean you, you look at a cost per nautical mile um, flown basis for something like your Lancer 360 you had or my legacy compared to a 182 Cessna you know late model 182 Cessna there may not be a, a 
you know, the, the Lance era may actually beat them on a cost per nautical mile basis. Mm -hmm. So we've been talking financial risk and insurance risk. Um, there's a special someone who just showed up in the YouTube <laughs> chat. Um, this special someone, I won't say who, um, you know, might be related to the location in which you're coming to us from, Joe. Somebody wants to know, what's the biggest risk you have taken without telling her, wink, wink? Your mom. <laughs> it's your mother. I got that. She's, she's concerned about you and wants to know your secrets. <laughs> There's only 15,000 people listening. What's what's up? <laughs> Please assure, Man, reassure your mother that you're okay. You know, the, the, I can't even think of an answer to that question, actually, because um, not because I'm trying to hide anything. But <laughs> it's a great answer. Because <laughs> everything is fine or all of the things are risks. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and that's exactly it. Everything we do as a pilot is risk. Everything we do as a human being has risk. Um, and as pilots, our biggest job, once we learn how to manipulate the flight controls and actually put an airplane in a position in space, um, our biggest job is to manage and mitigate risks. Um, and there's a, a wonderful quote, and I'm going to butcher it, but it's from um, either Orville or Wilbur Wright about how um, he's met, Orville, and Orville was quoted about you know, the early days of, of flying and about the risks he was taking. Um, and his quote is that deliberately taking risks, deliberately taken risks, um, have a chance of being mitigated. It's the people who don't acknowledge the risks that they're taking that have the danger. Um, and as pilots, um, that's our job. Our job is to understand what risks we have. Um, and hopefully you have the, ex and that's where experience is important, right? Because if you're approaching a big cloud and you don't know whether or not it's turbulent or there's a, uh, a big storm hiding inside of that cloud that can tear the airplane apart and things like that. That's where the experience comes in for you to be able to tell um, and, and have an informed idea of what your uh, risk pool is or your your um, what risks you're operating in the vicinity of. And then as a pilot, it's your job to manage those and decide whether or not they're acceptable or not. Um, so in relationship to uh, the question from a certain somebody, um, <laughs> yeah, it, there are risks that I choose to acknowledge and take, um, and and sometimes it, it depends on the scenario. If I'm in an airliner, the risks are very minimal, and for the most part, the risks that we are allowed to take are almost non-existent and very well defined what our response to those risks are. Um, if I'm on the first flight of a brand new long easy that I just built, um, obviously the risks that I'm accepting are bigger. Um, if I am doing a post maintenance test flight on something. Um, the risks are bigger than a standard flight, but less than a first flight on an airplane. And so you do things to mitigate those risks and to limit the, the potential outcomes. So you fly straight over the airport. You don't take passengers along, um, things like that. Uh, Sorry, mom, we didn't get a good jolting. <laughs> this was the moment where we had the biggest risk, but he overcame it. Yeah. Everything is risky, mom. Sorry. Well, it, is, it is an excellent it is an excellent strategy to always answer your mom with a quote from Orville Wright. So, <laughs> well, you know, I like um, it. Uh, yeah, so we're actually, while we're talking about passengers and, uh, passengers and things, is saying, is there a limit to the size of a home build or the number of passengers that you can carry w with such aircraft? The the answer to that is no. Um, there, during phase one flight testing, you can't carry any non-essential crew. So the first 40 hours of flying a brand new airplane, you have to go out and do a flight test program over a very... Uh, a tightly controlled, non-populated area to prove the airplane is safe and to understand how it operates. Um, but essentially, no, there is no limit to the size an experimental airplane can be as long as the inspector from the FAA or their representative will sign it off. So, for example, um, there are some experimentals out there that are uh, 10 passengers, I think, is what the uh, EPIC is. Um, the EPIC is a, a, a cabin class pressurized single engine turboprop that does, you know, 280 or 270, somewhere in there, not, uh, it's a pretty big airplane and it started out as an experimental. Um, so, you know, there's, there's really no limit as to what it can be. I guess the, the biggest limit is your pocketbook and your dreams. 
Wow. <laughs> so yeah, true. And Joe, I, I want to jump. We're going to come back because I want to talk about the Defiant Project too. But um, so I want to talk a little bit about knowledge transfer and over to your professional pilot career. So you fly for a major airline. What what lessons have you taken from uh, your private flying, experimental aircraft building? What kind of uh, knowledge transfer have you taken over into your professional flying uh, that that you wish you could kind of spread the word about to other professional pilots? Well, that's a good question and something I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about. But um, you know, there's the skills certainly transfer because we're operating in the same airspace and the same medium. Um, the laws of physics still hold true. Um, and one of the things that's a little bit disappointing in the um, professional flying arena is how much we, we rely upon automation and how we've kind of lost a little bit of the uh, passion for actually flying the airplane. Um, so I really appreciate it when I'm flying with people at work that choose to turn that stuff off and, and get a little bit of practice with actually manipulating flight controls instead of allowing, you know, the airplane that I fly, you can turn the autopilot on at 70 feet and it doesn't have to be off to 70 feet. So, you know, conceivably you could fly an entire flight, a, you know, a transcontinental flight and actually be manipulating the flight controls for three seconds. Um, yeah. That's something I could probably do. <laughs> for sure. Everybody can do it. I couldn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> Matt, you could do it. No, no, no. I'd be too busy. Go I'd be too busy going. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Views out the window, right? <laughs> yeah. but, um, so I, I wish, you know, people would spend a little bit more time with that. So if I were um, giving advice to up and coming professional pilots, it would be to, to keep honing your, your flying skills. Um, and, and that doesn't poo, poo the use of autopilots and the use of automation is a skill in, a, in and of itself, right? There are, there are, uh, there are finesse ways to utilize automation um, and understand what the automation is going to do for you. And, and that is a skill set in and of itself. Um, but, you know, maintaining your, your flying skills, um, continuing education, uh, learning about, um, you know, like I just got my glider rating. Um, that was uh, hugely beneficial in uh, um, my situational awareness in most airplanes. And, and, you know, hopefully we don't become gliders and, and you know, airliners anymore. Um, but learning the soaring skills helps you predict turbulence. It helps you predict where you're going to get mechanical turbulence, thermals, things like that. It helps you predict, um, aim points and, and whether or not you're high or low and, and, and uh, really fine tune some of that visual acuity, um, that we rely upon when we're, you know, flying visually and, and VFR. So I think continuing education, continuing to hone skills, continuing to have new, uh, experiences, um, and then trying to be as good about learning what the lessons are from each of those experiences really helps. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I just recently, you know, flying corporate uh, had a pilot that came on and, and I recommended that they go out and fly a tailwheel aircraft for a couple hours. It's like, you know, you, it still has a rudder. <laughs> Um, it's all automated, but at the end of the day, it's still got a rudder. Maybe, maybe go out and get a, an hour in a, in a cub or a satabra or something like that, and then come back and, and you'll be, uh, good to go. But I, I have, uh, so one kind of unique question. So you're involved in a lot of aspects of experimental and private aviation. Do you, are you ever worried that something, um, from one side would affect either your professional career? or or the other like either you know what is that is that in your head or do you just not think about it no it's a it's a wonderful question and it is um so and i'm going to actually take it a step further and that um when i was growing up around the airport i got the opportunity to be around a lot of um uh airline pilots corporate pilots people that were private pilots and had no interest in doing anything further than just being a private pilot or plane thing like land. And all those are wonderful things and fit these people. Um, and one of the things that I was worried about growing up was, will flying for a living take away my passion for aviation? Um, and so I want to take it back to that first. And I think it's pretty clear to see based on what I've been doing with my life that it hasn't. Um, and you don't have to let it. Some people let it. Um, and, and some people let 
some people let uh, the, the career take away their passion for aviation and then find their way back into it. I've been with a bunch of uh, my buddies from different airlines that um, call me up and say, hey, you know, I really miss flying. I'm like, well, you, what happened? Did you lose your medical? You're not at work? No, real flying. Um, that's the conversation that we have. And so we, you know, I've, I've talked to a couple of buddies and helped them look for cubs and uh, experimental airplanes and things like that. Um, yeah, the, the flying at work doesn't really scratch my itch for the type of flying that I want to do. They wouldn't be too fond of me going out and flying formation and doing an overhead break with the, uh, with the Airbus. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, the, so that's, your question reminded me of that. So I wanted to make sure we, we brought that up. But um, to, to more specifically answer your question, um, I'm, I'm worried about that all the time. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is if I screw up in a small airplane, it can take my livelihood away. Um, so I have to take it extremely seriously. Um, and not that everybody should, but I have to more than others because the risk is bigger for me. Um, so for example, when I was trying to decide, um, what kind of avionics I was going to put in the long easy, for example, because the long easy is way over avionics. Um, it's got, you know, ILS, GPS, you know, it's, it's got everything that needs to fly a fully coupled, you know, GPS approach, LPV approach, ILS approach, whatever. Um, and the reason I did that was because I don't want to be in a position at a fly-in where I'm trying to make it to work. So I'm, I need to go home and there's a thousand foot overcast layer. Um, and my choice is to either scud run below it or to illegally pop up through it. I don't want to be in that position. So I have to make sure that I have all the tools necessary to mitigate the risk to the extent possible. So I don't put myself in that position. Um, and there are ways to do that. Um, is it more expensive um, and requires more thought than, um, than not acknowledging that risk? Of course. Uh, but I think it's important if um, somebody is pursuing a professional aviation career um, that they uh, acknowledge those risks and decide to what extent they mitigate them. I mean, is is some of it though because it is very different flying? Because I mean, presumably, I mean, when you're when you're flying in races and things like that, that's a very very different skill set to, um, you know, doing a, a a commercial flight where you're going from airport to airport. I mean, is it is that perhaps why it doesn't have any impact on your on your passion for flying, if you like, because they're essentially two very different things. Yeah, for sure. I mean. I, I don't think my passion for flying would be the same if I was, and I'm not picking on this because this is a valiant aviation pursuit as well, but if I was flying a Cirrus from, you know, Milwaukee to um, BFW to, you know, to go and get a, a hamburger or something like that. But now I'm, I go and get the hundred dollar hamburger all the time. And every once in a while, I love doing that. <laughs> but if that was my only mission, um, yeah, I, I don't think I would have the same conversation with you guys right now, but um, you know, the, I, I thrive on teaching, learning, um, things that are hard, uh, things that give me a sense of accomplishment. Um, and I really think that's where pylon racing and formation flying is, is bringing me some, some excitement and joy in flying is because they are hard. They're really difficult to do well. Every time you come back, you have a laundry list of things you could have done better. Um, and conversely, there's a lot to learn and a lot of people that are willing to, to um, teach you that. So um, I think that's really the biggest thing for me. I think that's why I enjoy getting the glider rating um, is, you know, learning a new skill set and doing something that's difficult or hard and, and learning to, to be able to, um, I don't want to say master it because I'm, I'm not at mastery, but at least come to terms with how to do it relatively well. <laughs> well what you're doing translates into all aspects and you know, it, it's, you've got a really smart and diverse way of approaching your increased knowledge and your plans to continue increasing your knowledge and to share your knowledge. And uh, you talked about Reno. So can we just go to Reno now? I want to talk about Reno. <laughs> um, Perfect. So you were the sport class rookie of the year in 2019 when I first met you. And I think we met very briefly because you were very focused um, and you were also there, I believe, with your sponsor, uh, maybe your first sponsor, I don't know, um, Bendix King. And so, uh, first of all, how incredible did it feel to be the sport class rookie of the year in 2019? You know, um, it was 
was a huge honor. Um, I still pinch myself a little bit about it because, um, yeah, I, so to give you a little bit of background, um, I started in the Air Adventure Cup 23 years ago. And so in racing and, and in the crowds of people that race, including Reno, I've known a lot of these people for a very long time. Um, and the caliber and quality of people and the background and the skill set and the experiences of the people that um, are amongst my peers in the sport class at Reno, um, I don't even put myself in the same room or the same building as them. Um, and to be honored like that from that group of people was uh, pretty amazing. That's awesome. Uh, so then what, I mean, it sounds like it probably would have been a natural progression if you'd already been really familiar with all the people who are in Reno, who are racing, who are putting it together. It sounds like it just kind of made sense that you would race there since you've also been involved in the Air Venture Cup and you've been, you know, just flying all the things. But was there a moment when you were like, okay, this is what I need to do. I need to fly Reno. Yeah. Yeah. So um, actually, if you would have asked me that question five or six years ago and, and said that I would have flown at Reno, I would have told you you were nuts. Um, you know, up to about five or six years ago, I thought it was way too risky um, that I wouldn't have the skill set, that I would never be able to develop the skills that it would be out of reach both financially, skill-wise, all of these things for me. Um, and, and I would have believed it and I would have sworn up and down that I would have never been there. Um, and the, so to kind of tell you the story of how I, I went from that to racing at Reno, um, yeah, like I said, I knew a lot of these people and um, I was invited to come out and crew for Bob Mills, who's the president of the sport class. And at the time he was racing dual class, he was racing jets and in sport class. Um, and I was invited by his crew chief, who's a friend of ours, um, to uh, go out there and crew for Bob. So that kind of started um, getting me back involved out at Reno. Um, and I, um, I crewed, I helped wrench on the airplane, clean the airplane, make sure it was where it, it had to be. And as a part of doing that, um, I got to sit in on some of the pilot briefings, got to ask more direct questions while I was there and thinking about it. I got to observe how all of this got put together. Um, and as I did that, I started to see the gap between who I saw them as and who I saw myself as kind of narrow a little bit. Um, and after my second year of crewing um, and seeing some of the cool things that happen in the, the development and, and how hard people work at it and all of those things that started getting my juices flowing, I'm like, you know, I could probably do this. And then eventually I got to the point where I'm like, okay. Bob, what does it take for me to get my long easy here? What does it take for me to come to PRS? Um, and after that, I was very, very much focused on the goal of getting to Reno. And so I started with um, trying to make Betty fast enough to get to Reno. Unfortunately, I failed miserably at that. Um, and when I was um, quantifying what I was doing, I was working really hard, spending a lot of time modifying an airplane that was going to to claw and at best be at the bottom of the class. Um, and it would be really hard to make it at the bottom of the class, um, make the airplane fast enough to make the bottom of the class. And so I reevaluated and about that time at work, I had a uh, overnight in Norfolk, Virginia, which is where Andy Finley lives um, and uh, Sport 30. And I uh, texted him and said, hey, I'm gonna have a long overnight in Norfolk. He's like, perfect, I need help doing an oil change when I come out to the airport. So, we go out to the airport and um, I'm like, well, what do we change the oil? And he's like, well, I got somebody's legacy that we need to change the oil on. I'm like, okay, no problem. He's like, but you know, we need to start it. And if we're going to start it, you might as well not waste the start. We might as well go fly. Um, and so that was my very first Lancer legacy airplane ride. He let me fly it. Um, and it was the most expensive free airplane ride I've ever had. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, that's a heck of a first airplane ride is the, wow. the, gold, the gold race champion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was in a friend's airplane. It wasn't in 30, but um, it was with him. Um, out of his home airport. So um, after that, I got to thinking, you know, why, and it may have also been, because I stayed at his house that night, it may have also been over a little bit of bourbon or scotch. On his, <laughs> on As his good couch. decisions are usually. I'm, but, I'm, de I'm definitely uh, needing, you know, noting a theme in aviation, by the way. There <laughs> seems to be a lot of bourbon drunk of an evening. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, that's where all good good ideas come from. That's how the Air Venture Cup actually got started. Was, oh, fair enough. Was yeah. a, a couple of uh, barley pops at the uh, at the fire at Oshkosh. But wow. Um, yeah. So 
we came up with the idea of kind of forgetting about, you know, trying to claw our way into the bottom of the class with the long easy and eventually found a legacy. And that's, that's how we got there. So that's awesome. You mentioned Bob Mills. So I have to say we did have Bob Mills on this podcast also. Uh, I think episode 320 was when we aired the first segment of the interview that Armando did with him. Uh, and so I just felt like I needed to plug that. I'm not part of yeah. this podcast. I'm just a guest host. <laughs> No, it was it was it was pretty fun to have Bob uh, come on the show. And on, on the very first part of his interview, he's talking to us about punching out of an F-14 Tomcat off a carrier in the middle of the night into the into whatever ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. And then, and that that set the tone for the rest of his three part interview. So go back and listen to that. Because <laughs> it's it's pretty cool. Yeah, <laughs> it is pretty, he's cool. A pretty cool guy. But I, I will say guy, also, yeah. yeah, he's a really good guy. Um, but I will say also, you said that when you, if I'd asked you that question five or six years ago, you would have been like, you're crazy. There's no way. Uh, Joe, you have this quiet confidence about you. Is that fake? <laughs> because it just <laughs> seems like you are so cool, calm and collected, even under some insane stress and circumstances like at Reno, but you are just so just even keeled. Is, is it like that duck syndrome, isn't it? Is it, it where, where like under the water, the legs are going absolutely bananas, <laughs> but above the water, it's calm and tranquil. <laughs> I, I don't even know how to answer that question. Um, yeah. <laughs> that confidence has think... developed over the last few years as you were thinking about it and then planning for it. And, you know, all the risks are known and now mitigated and, Right. Trust me, whether trust me, whether or not you can see it on the outside, that that there's there are times where there's a helmet fire going on upstairs. Um, it doesn't know, show. Like, you you look very cool, calm, and collected. Well, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll exactly. tell you what. I'll, I'll save you from answering that question any further. <laughs> I, I know you uh, you very much value the people that are around you. This I'm going to give you a moment to acknowledge. You have one of the best crews at reno and you have one of the most fun crews at reno only to be rivaled by george's crew which is always right <laughs> next door so it all just melds into one crew especially after 5 p.m happy when... family yeah. yeah but uh tell me a little bit about your crew uh i know them i i've met them and, and there are some amazing individuals but who 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 is it that you that you need to acknowledge you know public shout out for for getting you to reno safely and, for ramp rat racing reno. You know, the, um, I have, ever since I was 12, way back even before Ramp Rat Racing, um, there has been a long list of, of people that have supported me and helped me reach my goals in aviation. Um, and that is just something that has continued with Ramp Rat Racing. Um, yeah, I've kind of operated under the theory in my entire aviation career that if you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. Um, and it's a, a, a community or a group event. And so um, we've, we've kind of carried that on through with, uh, with our race team um, from our sponsors all the way through the crew. Um, and I'd be remiss if I didn't try and name a couple of them by name, but there are so many people that have helped me out um, throughout the, my entire journey as well as um, through racing that um, it would be hard to name them all. So I, I don't want this to sound like an exhaustive list and I don't want to uh, offend anybody if I haven't gotten everybody, but um, I certainly want to acknowledge my crew chief. Um, Dick Kite has been a mentor of mine in aviation for a very, very long time. Um, ever since I, man, it's gotta be since 1998. Um, and I used to be his crew chief for the Poland special, uh, one of a kind airplane that he um, brought out in the Air Venture Cup and um, set some world records and it was the fastest four cylinder engine powered vehicle in the world for a while. Um, so I did, I was his crew chief for a while. Um, and now he's my crew chief, which is really awesome. We're trying to get him out to PRS and, um, get him qualified as a sport class racer oh, this coming year. Wow. If we can. In fact, um, in fact, I told him, I said, cause he said, well, I don't have an airplane that does 200 miles an hour right now in the Poland, uh, you know, is in a, uh, prolonged restoration right now. I said, well, that's fine. Um, start working on finding a 200 mile an hour airplane. Cause if you don't find one, you're going to fly mine. And I'm going to be really upset if I don't get to go out and fly with you. So um, I put a little bit of pressure on him to, to find an airplane to, to come and, and race with us. Um, and then I've got 
Uh, Greg Struve has been a longtime crew member of mine. Um, he helped me build Betty, uh, uh, long, easy builder as well. Um, a friend of mine from up in Minneapolis. Um, we had uh, a, a new crew member this year, Jared Latimer, who put together a lot of the really cool video clips that we did at, at Reno um, and really stepped up and helped us a lot. A lot. Um, my husband, Kevin, has been on the crew. He's the Minister of Finance. Um, so he's the one that really makes the project work, whether or not it you know, makes the decisions for us. I, I love that. Um, the mini- the Minister of Minister Finance. Of I finance, love that. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, that's essentially, that's great right. title. Cle- clearly the sensible one in this relationship. <laughs> that's, what I, that's what I've also named Megan, because every right. airplane that I look at with a for sale sign, I'm Lovely. like, that's yes. the one. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. and she just rolls her eyes and says, no. Yeah. <laughs> the, there's a, going to be a next the one every time there's a new <laughs> yeah, at least it's well, you know, well, you know, a lot, you know, there you go. Some people ask me, you know, why do you have three airplanes? And the answer is because you have to have three in order to get to four. Right. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yes, there is that. Yes. So, oh, poor Kevin. <laughs> wow. But, you know, um, there's a couple more people to There's, um, you know, Brian Mitchell, Travis Foss, um, uh, Nick, my mechanic, um, who is on George's team as well. Um, and then one of the cool things about the sport class is we pretty much all, you know, share our resources and whatnot. I mean, there's some things we hold back, but, um, yeah, pretty much the entire sport class has helped me out at some point or another. Um, uh, Eric White, Annalise, uh, Jack, um, you know, all kinds of really cool people that, that help out. I, to Armando's point, I do have a relatively, uh, big team and, and it's fun and, they enjoy the experience just as much as I appreciate having them there. And it's, it's been a really awesome experience. And then I'd be remiss also um, from the location where I'm coming from, my mom and dad and grandparents and brothers and sisters have all been extremely supportive. And it's, it's really fun when you know, you've got all that support coming from home too. So yeah. I, bet. I, bet. Um, I feel like now- that's a critical piece to have that support <laughs> coming from home, you know, that, that grounding support almost. Well, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I mean, I, you know, I would get done from a race or whatever, and I'd come back to text messages from them and all that kind of stuff, you know, um, watching it on the iPad or whatever on the live stream. And so it's pretty cool. As they're watching you now as well. <laughs> <laughs> well quite. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I'll tell you what, um, you know, we're going to put, um, we're going to give you a chance to talk about, you, you know, your website and all that stuff. But um, I know Jared this year did a lot of work. Um, putting some videos together, some amazing videos. Um, we played out one of them while you were talking there. Um, but we'll we'll make sure that we put your website into the show notes because Jared's been working so hard and he's just producing some really quality stuff. And and um, I can attest to the the uh, the fact that the entire sport class really comes together um, for any one problem, regardless of what goes on out on the on the track. But. I'm, so I want to move on a little bit to to Air Venture Cup, um, which is the reason kind of I thought about you last week was um, tell us a little bit about the Air Venture Cup. What is it? What is your role in it? Tell us about the people, the airplanes. How do you guys come up with the route? Yeah, so the, um, the Air Venture Cup is a, a cross-country air race. It's one of the only actual flying events that you can participate in as an official part of Air Venture every year in Oshkosh. Um, it was uh, founded by, by Eric White and Eric Anderson, two uh, longtime friends of mine. Um, Eric White being the guy that gave me my first Young Eagle ride. Um, and uh, the, the idea behind the race was to recreate the, exci- uh, recreate the excitement of the Bendix Trophy races from the 1930s and 40s. Um, there were a couple of other races going on at that time in the country, but they were poorly managed, uh, poorly uh, marketed and uh, lesser participation. Um, and so uh, after participating in one of those uh, races, Eric and Eric were sitting around the campfire at Oshkosh having a couple of beverages and said, you know, well, we, we could organize a race. We could, you know, what would we do if we organized a race? How would we do it better? And that's really the genesis of where the uh, Air Venture Cup started. I was going to say, I was gonna say th- th- there's that link again. There's that link More there. More good ra- ideas. Around ra- ra- a campfire with a couple of beverages <laughs> in hand. I know, let's organize an air race. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
The, exactly. the good idea right. fairy lives at the bottom of a bottle of Jack. <laughs> I bet, I bet, yeah. I mean, what, I mean, let, only... I can say, well, let's start with the challenges. I mean, what? Uh, I mean, is, uh, as you say, literally round a campfire. That's a great idea. You know, you, you've come up with an idea of something that perhaps doesn't doesn't quite tick the boxes of something that's already out there at the moment. So, how do you turn that campfire idea, if you like, into? Um, you know, a, a huge event like this. So, you know, the, um, usually the challenges are getting approval from the, the, um, the bodies that you have to, the FAA, um, EAA, all of the other groups that you have to get the approvals from. That's the, that's the biggest challenge. All the logistics as pilots, we're pretty used to, to working out those logistics. Um, but, uh, getting all of the people on board is usually the trouble. And, and Eric and Eric did a wonderful job of that. Um, both the, uh, um, uh, yeah, the regulators, uh, getting EA to, to get excited about the idea and then also starting to develop a, uh, following and people that wanted to race. So that's, that's really the hard part. Um, the logistics, um, while they can be challenging from time to time are, are relatively straightforward ish. Um, so but uh yeah so the air venture cup started um the idea was to connect the first flight to the world of flight uh first flight being kitty hawk north carolina world of flight being uh oshkosh for air venture and so um the uh up through the 100th anniversary of powered flight which happened in 2003 the race course was from kitty hawk to oshkosh um for some of those years we um stopped in um Dayton, Ohio, and made it into a two-day, two-leg event. Um, some of those years, we ran it as a one-day race. Um, after 2003, um, when the, after the 100th anniversary of Powered Flight, we turned it into a one-day event, and we went from Dayton to uh, Oshkosh. And then um, I think it was in 2011 or 12 or something like that, uh, Mitchell, South Dakota, uh, expressed an interest in and hope hosting the race so we would alternate years between going east and west uh starting in dayton or mitchell um somewhere along the way mountain vernon worked their way in there so um we've started in a bunch of different cities this last year with covid being a challenge um we knew we were going to end in wisconsin so we decided to keep it essentially all in wisconsin so that if there was a covid shutdown we weren't dependent on we didn't need two states to be open in order to be able to run it we only needed one um, so we did a round robin course this year from um, uh, a town northwest of Oshkosh called Wausau, Wisconsin. We did a round robin course around there. Um, so that's kind of the, the gist of it. Um, we pride ourselves on having a race class for anybody who wants to race. So um, whatever kind of aircraft you have, whatever kind of uh, pilot you are, uh, we want you to come race with us. So we've got certified, we've got experimental. Um, we've had everything from a J3 Cub to a Beechcraft Premier Jet race. We've had P-51s and Corsairs. We've had a ton of long easies, um, lots of RVs, Lancers, Glassairs, um, tons of different types of airplanes. Uh, we've got categories that we break people up into based on if it's a certified uh, airplane, experimental airplane, um, engine configuration, landing gear configuration. So we try and make it uh, fair for everybody. Um, if we get three or more of a particular type of airplane, we'll make a class for them. So like the SX 300s have their own class and they're racing amongst themselves. Um, so we really try and make it fun and competitive for everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, as far as pilot skill goes, it's a cross country race. If you can plan a cross country, you can race the Air Venture Cup. It's as simple as that. Um, we've had everybody from, uh, recreational pilots and private pilots to astronauts to, um you know just about everything in between that have come and raced the adventure cup so um the thing i love about it is it's very inclusive everybody can do it um the barriers to entry are very low there's a little bit of uh, um a paperwork exercise that you have to do in order to get approved to race um but other than that i think people um anybody who's come and tried the race has enjoyed it has enjoyed the camaraderie of the people and uh it's just a really neat event do you get to bring a passenger or is it just you by yourself? You, you do. So you can have, uh, and and we don't allow passengers, but we allow co-pilots. So, okay, gotcha. Um, got to be doing something. <laughs> you got to be doing something. So Dang. Uh, one of the cool things actually is uh, with this race is it is something you can share. You can share it with your spouse. 
Um, we've had a bunch of um, father, daughter, father, son, um, grandfather, grandson, um, you know, a whole bunch of, of different groups come and race the race. Um, and that's really one of the neat things about it. That's cool. Armando's giving me a look right now, like, hey, let's do this. Absolutely. <laughs> I see that. Now, now that I know I don't have to be in the lands here and I could do it, we could do it in the, in the uh, TBM or a Tobago or maybe the Pilatus or something like that. We'll do it. I see there's a Cessna caravan in there. Come on, we can borrow a caravan. That's right. We can borrow one. Does it have to be our airplane, or can we? No, can we, we just rent one airplane. for the okay? Maybe, the maybe, maybe not. One. I can say maybe yeah. not. Now is the time for that particular discussion on air. Uh, <laughs> oh, okay. right, right, right. This is usually how it goes like every two weeks. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! Yeah, I'm looking at all the classes on the. So it's uh, airventurecuprace.com, and that's you know part of EA or I guess sponsored by EA, but it is its own. It's own thing because you guys are, are, are organizing body right like right yeah it's an official so, part of the the, the air venture flying and we are sponsored by EA and, we, and um but we are a, a separate organization that that organizes it yeah so the way I, to observe this would be to just show up to air venture yes or is it a separate time frame so it's the, it's always the weekend before oshkosh um the and we race before, on okay. sunday weather weather permitting um, and uh, the way the weekend goes usually is most people arrive on Friday. Uh, we hold a uh, informal happy hour on Friday night. There we go again, happy hour. Um, <laughs> and uh, then Saturday at the uh, host city, we hold a airport open house and try and get some of the local community out um, and try and educate some of the local community about the value of the airport and general aviation. Uh, give them an opportunity to come out and talk to the race pilots, see the race airplanes, sit in the airplanes. Um, and then during that time, you know, a lot of the people that fly in the Adventure Cup are formation qualified and um, are looking for any excuse to go out and fly. So they will uh, go out and organize these formation photo missions and go fly over the city and try and drum up attention for people to come out to the airport. Um, then Sunday is usually race day um, and people come out and watch the, the race launch. So, well, uh, and like everything yeah, else, that it's a whole that... weekend of fun. Um, well, like everything else at Air Venture, you you guys also need volunteers, right? So you don't have to be a pilot to participate in the rate in the race. You you can volunteer. Um, what are some of the roles that volunteers can do? Yeah, um, that's a great question. We're we're actually putting together a formal volunteer program now to try and grow our volunteer corps. And um, you know, we have needs for everything from webmasters and IT people to media people to uh, people to help out with um, evaluating uh, paperwork and risk management stuff, uh, flight operations, um, you know, logistics for hotels and catered meals and things like that. So there's 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 a lot of different roles and responsibilities that we have in that the volunteer group um, coordinates. So yes, if you have an interest in volunteering or um, participating in that capacity, um, by all means, please send us a note and we'll be happy to find a, a good fit for you. Yeah, and you can go to the website airventurecuprace.com and there's actually a volunteer uh, tab. You can hit sign up now and that, that'll shoot a message to Joe and the team. Um, so, Joe, I, I want to end. We, we've actually got a lot of a lot of uh, interest in the long easy. Now, now that you've been talking about it, we played out the video. But I, I actually want to end with, with your project, The Defiant. So, first of all, I, I know airplanes and I'd never heard of this. So, what what is The Defiant's? Defiant. What? How did you end up with this airplane? What are you doing with it? What? What's the deal with that? So, um, yeah, the Defiant is kind of a, a rare and obscure airplane, and, and if you haven't kind of figured it out, for the most part, I, that's one of the things that you know interests me about airplanes. Is if the more rare and more obscure it is, the the more I'm probably interested in it. But uh, it's a um, originally a rutan design. Uh, Bert designed it in the late seventies. Um, and the Defiant is a four-seat, twin-engine, push-pull, canard-configured airplane. Um, so it's kind of like the big brother to the Long Easy uh, with two engines. And the idea behind the airplane was, how could you make a multi-engine airplane that didn't have a critical engine and wasn't less safe on one engine than a single-engine airplane? Um, and, and, 
yeah, the, the controllability issue of asymmetric thrust is what Bert Rukan was, was referring to there. Um, and so he came up with this airplane and the Defiant was Bert Rutan's favorite airplane. So he came up with his second, his newer favorite airplane, the Boomerang. Um, but uh, there's only about 25 uh, Defiants out there flying, um, mostly because it's a large airplane with two engines, a little bit more expense um, and a very, very long build time. But it's always been an airplane I've been kind of interested in. I've um, been fortunate enough to fly one a couple of times. One of uh, um, the Air Venture Cup racers. We actually have a Defiant class in the Air Venture Cup just for the Defiant. Um, but uh, one of the longtime Air Venture Cup racers is here in the Southeast Wisconsin area, and I've gotten to fly his airplane a couple of times. And nice flying airplane. Um, so I've always kind of had a hankering for him, but knew that it would take a really long time to build. Um, this particular Defiant found me. Um, during COVID, and um, the uh, the airplane was originally started. Is that what you tell airplane. your minister of finance? It found you. <laughs> exactly. It, fo it followed me home from the airport one day, and so I had to give it home. <laughs> you know exactly how that works. <laughs> I love um, it. Yeah. So it was um, originally started by um, uh, Brian Martinez in um, the. Uh, near Edwards Air Force Base is, uh, and now the name of the town that I picked it up from is, is escaping me, but it's near Mojave where um, all of these airplanes were developed. And so um, Brian was a longtime airplane builder. Unfortunately, in April of um, 2020, he passed away unexpectedly. Um, and the family had this, this project that they didn't know what to do with. And Brian had spent 20 years of his life building on this airplane. Um, his, his kids, his wife, um, we're all um, invested in the airplane as as happens, right? When somebody spends that amount of time um, working on something in the family that it's, his family was invested in the airplane. And um, his wife, Arlene, didn't quite know what to do with it. Um, and so she reached out to the Canard um, Owners and Builders Association and put an ad on their um, on their uh, chat group or their, their web boards about this airplane being available and um, I saw it and as I opened the pictures and started looking at it more and more and more, um, as a builder, knowing where some of the hard parts and the long e easy were to build, um, I could see some of the pictures and, and while there's a lot that you can't tell from pictures, in this case, you could tell a lot. Um, this was not a, a normal Defiant. In fact, Brian called it his Defiant derivative aircraft. Um, and his premise for the airplane was that um, Burt Rutan designed prototypes and sold plans to prototypes. They were never quite actually finished through to a refined final product. Um, and so Brian's idea was, if Burt Rutan were to take the Defiant and turn it into a refined final product to market, what would he do? And that was the, the, the um, idea that informed all of Brian's decisions for the airplane. So for example, the um, uh, Long Easy and Defiant are normally made with wet layup construction over um, flat pieces of foam. They're slab-sided fuselages with the corners rounded. Um, instead of doing that, Brian lofted a completely aerodynamic shape from spinner to spinner and changed the fuselage uh, shape so it was completely aerodynamic. Um, every cross-section was in the lift. Um, and, and it just flows so beautifully and he, he created one off molds to vacuum bag and do it with honeycomb core and all the lightweight technologies of, you know, 20 years ago. Um, and so it is a very airplane, um, and, and has a aesthetic to it that most Rutan airplanes don't in my opinion. Um, so when I started looking at this project, I'm like, man, if, if I'm ever going to do a Defiant, it has to be this one because he's done all the things that I would do to it at the time and money weren't an issue. Um, and so uh, I started negotiating with um, his family and, and promised his family that I would finish his airplane. Um, and so now what I'm trying to do is I'm, I'm trying to finish Brian's DDA and the vision in which he started it. Um, trying to use lightweight te uh, techniques, make it a very aerodynamic, very pleasing airplane um, of the highest quality, highest build quality that I know how to do. So um, I'm hoping to, to follow through on that promise for the family um, and eventually get them rides in, in Brian's airplane. Yeah, and we, I guess, predominantly fly glass airplanes, what we call glass airplanes, which are 
uh, fiberglass, e-glass, carbon, um, something like that. I know the RVs are are metal. They're a great way to to get into aircraft building, but when you're when you're taking this kind of follow up to Matt's question, like when you're taking on this this uh, project, like the Defiant, and you're a bit off the reservation, there isn't a precedent for this. How how are you coming up with these ideas? And and do you know how do you, how do you learn how to do fiberglass work or or molding work or any of that? So um, it's a lot of trial and error, um, and then also a lot of crowdsourcing. Um, I've got a background in fiberglass from having built Betty, um, so a lot of the techniques of the '70s and '80s I know, um, and and I can do those really well. Um, but to take that to the next step and be able to do um mold making vacuum bagging vacuum infusion all of that kind of stuff that's a whole nother level and luckily i've got some people that have helped me out richard kasmerick of aviation composites um a couple of other people as well but uh, you know i call richard quite a bit uh, michael bergen um uh, and a couple of tom mcnerney um, from the sport class um so I, I call a bunch of these people when i have a challenging problem where i'm not quite getting the results that i want um, and then I use their information and their, their guidance to help me refine my processes, or maybe I need a different tool or I need to consider something else. Um, but at the end of the day, the other thing has been persistence with this airplane. Um, if you look at a couple of blog posts back, um, well, it's more than probably a couple, um, but I've been trying to learn how to do vacuum infusion. And I had a little, um, three inch inlet that I was trying to, uh, infuse. And um, so I made molds and well, we 3D printed one and we made a mold off of that. Um, I tried to vacuum bag or, or vacuum resin infuse uh, from that and it failed miserably. Um, and all of the parts were usable, but the surface finish was terrible. Um, it wasn't something I was proud of. So I kept going. I ended up making 12 <laughs> or 13 of these inlets wow, before I got gosh. one I was, I was happy with. Um, so it's been a huge learning process for me um, with a lot of uh, frustrations. Um, if I would have just gone and, and done the, the old way of doing it, uh, it would have been easy and we would have been done with that a long time ago. Um, but, you know, Brian vacuum bags his airplane. He wants it as lightweight as possible. Um, he wants the surface finish to be beautiful. And so in keeping with the standard that he set when he made the first part, I couldn't just brute force my way through those inlets. I had to figure out the way of doing it in an elegant manner. And, and so we've, we've learned a lot. Um, I still have more to learn. They're still not perfect, but I'm <laughs> making a lot of progress in learning that stuff. So it's crowdsourcing, it's YouTube videos, um, and crown error. I tell you, I mean, I, genuinely, I don't know how uh, a lot of us uh, were able to do the things we can do with it before uh, YouTube came along. I mean, I've lost count of the amount oh of goodness. pieces of technology that I've stripped down and rebuilt as a result of watching <laughs> someone else do it on YouTube. I mean, a uh, small part, the nervous flyer right. in me finds it very terrifying that you can also do that with an aeroplane, I'll be honest. But <laughs> <laughs> and an experimental airplane, you can use stuff from the, you know, used car parts store. You can use stuff you find from Ikea. I mean, who knows? Just go for it. Wow. Throw it in there. She's not wrong. <laughs> wow. That's that is, uh, that's yeah. not helping, Megan, I'll be honest. Uh, <laughs> uh, just kidding. I didn't mean anything I just said. Good. No, Lovely. It's totally wrong. <laughs> I do have a question for you, Joe. I know we're probably going to be wrapping up here soon. And um, these lovely podcast gentlemen typically ask one final question of all of their uh, interviewees. And I feel like this question might not, I don't know, it might not be relevant because you've flown how many different types of aircraft, like 80 or some crazy large number? 89. Okay. Wow. Wow. Um, so <laughs> the typical question may not apply. So I'm going to ask you a different question. Um, you guys can feel free to ask the regular question too, but I'm very curious to know, Joe, what is up next for you? What, what is your next thing? Uh, maybe a different thing or, or what's your, what's your plan for aviation going forward? You know, the hard part is, is every time I add a next thing, I, I'm not willing to let go of any of the other things. Um, and, and time is, is getting thinner and thinner. So, uh, 
Um, I right now the next thing is trying to make the race plane faster and trying to keep the defining going. Um, so while that may not be a next thing, it's kind of what's what's coming up. Um, you know, the the dreams that I have for aviation and flying are um, endless. Uh, much to my chagrin, there's there's never never seems to be an end. There <laughs> never seems to be enough time to do all the things that I want to do. Um, I've got an idea for an original design uh, racer that fits within the sport class rules that I think would clean house at at Reno. Um, I'd love awesome. to build that. Um, you know, there's a couple of other original airplanes that uh, just lost an earpod there. Um, the uh, the there's a couple of other original design airplanes that I'd like to eventually get around to. Um, but, uh, for the short term, it's going to be, uh, keeping going on Brian's defiant and then, uh, trying to find a little bit of extra speed in the, in the race legacy. So worthy goals. Absolutely. Yeah, I like it. Well, Matt, do you want to take it? Oh, shall I? Okay. All right. So uh, we ask all of our guests uh, one uh, question that is uh, very simple, really, and we like to put you on the spot. That's why we don't tell you that we're going to ask this question in advance. Now, as I say, again, uh, Megan's alluded it's really to this because we're really, we, we'd be really fascinated, given your background, what, what you would choose. So if money was no object uh, and it doesn't matter whether the aircraft is currently flying or retired, basically any aircraft in time... What aircraft would you most love to have a go of flying? So what aircraft would you most love to sort of grab hold of the controls of it? As I say, w- w- past or present? Oh, man. Um, wow. Um, well, to Meg's point, I've actually... <laughs> so I kind of feel like that question begs a new airplane, one that I haven't flown yet. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, oh. this is an answer we have not yet heard, Yeah, is yeah, it? yeah. I like and it. and if it you know luckily one of those airplanes I have already flown so my answer to that question would have been the rutan boomerang if I hadn't already flown it but I've already gotten the chance to fly it so I feel like I have to say something different nice, um, nice. man all of them um, I want to fly <laughs> will all it of them. be will it be the ramp rat aircraft of 2025? Well, if if we can get it done by 2025, absolutely. 2030. Uh, The Caraggio Caraggio um, Ramp Rat airplane. (laughs) I think I actually just thought of one. Um, I think the P-38. Okay. Yeah. I think the P-38 would be mine. And, and, And I think that's. Uh, is, uh, any reasoning behind that? I mean, is there something that jumps out that you think, yeah, that's a pretty cool aircraft? Because it's beautiful and oh, it used okay. to race at Reno. <laughs> All of the above. Right. And, Fair and enough. it's somewhat unique. Okay. Um, I mean, there are a lot of them that were built, but there's not very many of them still flying. Um, and, you know, the, um, the videos that YouTube puts out um, from uh, um, over in Europe when they're flying their their airplanes that's one of my favorite ones to watch fly it just seems like such a graceful airplane when they're out doing their photography and videography of it um yeah it's a i think that's a a good answer to that beautiful airplane so i mean what's again what's fascinating for me i mean you know we've been lucky that we've had lots of pilots on here i mean nobody i i don't think has ever had quite the the type rating list i think that 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 you have is there out of all the aircraft that you've flown is there one that that has been particularly memorable for you whether it be in commercial or or um you know sort of in, in race flying even you know um I, there's a bunch that stand out. Um, and it's hard, you know, it's kind of like asking somebody to pick their favorite kid. They're all awesome. Uh, (laughs) And, uh, yeah, I've gotten to fly the right model B flyer. Um, I've gotten to fly the, uh, B 17, uh, the spaceship two simulator, uh, routine boomerang, a P 51. Um, yeah, the, the list is, is pretty extensive and, and, you know, spans many different eras and configurations and technologies. Um, and there is something fascinating and elegant about each and every one of them uh, that makes them all fun. Just fantastic. Just yeah. fantastic. 
Uh, Micah in the chat room uh, points out that the Germans used to call it the Fork Tail Devil. Oh, <laughs> the P thirty eight Lightning because it was it was so fast and good at what it did. I had an Allison yep. aircraft, but love it. Uh, Joe, I want to take a second to thank you for coming on the show. I can't believe it's uh, it's been this long before we had you on the show. But uh, thanks for taking some time out of your visit with your family. Um, I'll give you a chance now to plug your plug the website, plug the social media. Um, there's some cool uh, merch that both Megan and I are. Well, I'm not sporting mine, but Megan's got hers on. <laughs> um, what, where can we find you? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me on. Uh, and to uh, get to do it to an audience is even that much more special. Thank you to all the listeners. And uh, if you want to learn more about Ramp Rat Racing or any of my airplane projects, you can find us at rampratracing.com. Um, we're on Facebook and Instagram as well. Um, information about my airplane build for the, uh, Betty as well as the stuff that we've done for the Defiant is on my blog, which is garageoaviation.com. Uh, play off my last name and, and where we do the airplane building. Um, and uh, we do on our Ramp Rat Racing uh, site, we are trying to um, – you know, get a little bit of revenue for helping support flying the race plane by selling some merchandise. We're going to try and come up with a uh, cheeky, racy T-shirt uh, once a quarter. So hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have the next version out that'll be available for Christmas. Um, the current one is the one that we did for, you know, let's see if I can get the camera down there. Actually, <laughs> Meg's probably the better one to, to um, show it off. But we got a couple of different versions of our fly shirt. Um, the L is supposed to look like the uh, pylon at Reno. And on the bottom, it says my second favorite F word. And then on the back, it says uh, fast, my favorite F word. Um, we've right. got women's okay. tank tops with women, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I was very disappointed to find out that um, my favorite F word was not on the back. But, you know, being a family show, I'm not going to say that F word. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but this is, the women's, this is the women's tank top, and it's very comfortable. It's like the softest one that I own. I love it. Oh, cool. uh, and I, I heard a little something about I might get a special design with my favorite F word. Oh, oh for that'd be sake. cool. <laughs> shameless Probably plugging yeah i can say shameless plugging for her own merch you know her own range of merchandising there my own Honestly. line of yeah, yeah, the yeah. ramp rat racing right t-shirts. okay yeah. who knows it, 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 if you, it could have a it could be a new string i mean i am into fitness fitness is my my favorite f word yeah that's, right. that's what it is uh, of course yes yeah, yeah. i like that um <laughs> we do also um if you're not into the t-shirts we have a sticker with the the saying on it as well that's made out of vinyl you can put on the airplane or on toolboxes and whatnot um and for the next week if uh, you go ahead and decide to uh, get one of the t-shirts um there is a promo code um that we've got and just gotta look at real quick it's plain talking just plain talking one word if you put that uh, promo code in you'll get 15 percent off oh, wow. merchandise at ramparatracing.com wow. Oh, wow fantastic how cool is that um, love that love that well, what... i'd also like to take a second yeah, of course. Real quick, just to thank my sponsors. You know, the um, without having sponsors, the race plane weight race, uh, we can't do it. It is a, a costly endeavor, um, and we're fortunate enough to have quite a few of them. Um, we've got Method Seven sunglasses. Uh, we've got a Crew Chief Systems, r &E oil coolers, Ryan Aircraft Tool. Um, we've got uh, Aero Crafted, um, Air Capital Insurance, which is now. Um, capital uh air capital insurance um and then uh we've got a couple of youtube people as well with at fly with guys and at nixon and so really want to uh, send a shout out to them and uh say thank you very much for all of your continued support of ramp racing so absolutely no more more than welcome as i say i mean it, and again with anything like this as you say it's so expensive i mean the sponsorship is just crucial isn't it to to make these amazing things happen yeah. Yes, for sure. Yeah. So I, 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 I can say I feel a bit left out on the merchandise uh, front. I mean, we'll, we'll, what what we'll do, Joe, is we'll have to send you a PTUK mug. I think that's about all we can we can muster from <laughs> from our end here. I mean, I, I could also send you a Park Radio uh, car sticker, but I don't. That's that's not going to help you much, is it? Really. <laughs> There, there may be incriminating evidence, uh, video-wise, of oh. Joe tagging a lot of airplanes at Reno with this said sticker. <laughs> some most appreciated, some didn't. Oh, oh, really? Oh, oh, well, and actually, it's 
I don't know what we're going to do with them yet, but I also um, had Jeff Lavelle um, take along on Sunday's gold race, take along four of my fly stickers. And so we've got 400 mile an hour stickers that are um, autographed by Jeff Lavelle, the guy who took sport gold this year. Um, so those airplanes went over 400 miles an hour um, in the uh, race wow. course. And we're going to be doing some kind of a promotion to give them away on our social media site. So um, if you haven't liked or subscribed um, or followed our social media sites, go ahead and do that for the opportunity at some point to uh, um, receive a foreign mile an hour sticker. And uh, just, just rem- cool. remind everybody how they find your social media. Uh, it's at Ramp Racing on Instagram. And then uh, Ramp Racing is the name of the Facebook page as well. I'm going to get you to say that again because it broke and up just as you were saying that. That's uh, so. Uh, yeah, just just give give that another run because it broke down while you were uh, while you were saying that. It's at Ramp Rat Racing for Instagram, um, and then also Ramp Rat Racing on Facebook. And there are links to those from our website as well, which is RampRatRacing.com. Fantastic. I like it. Uh, before Matt takes us out with our own social media. Um, Hey guys, it's Thanksgiving. What's everybody up to this week? So, Joe, are you staying up there in Wisconsin? No, we're going to actually head back uh, home to Phoenix, and my grandparents have a place in uh, in Scottsdale there, so we'll spend uh, uh, Thanksgiving with my ninety and ninety four year old grandma and grandfather. Oh and wow! Some cousins and aunts and uncles. So, oh, that sounds amazing. That, well, that, that's what Thanksgiving is all about, isn't it? It's weird. It's, it's one of the few Americanisms that we haven't picked up here in the UK, really, is it? We've, we, you know, so sort of Christmas is a much bigger, bigger deal for the, than sort of Thanksgiving and stuff for us, I guess. Although, I mean, we start, we're starting to get into Halloween. I noticed that that was a big thing this year. <laughs> oh yeah, that wasn't a big thing when I was living over there. I remember yeah. like our little American kids are all dressed up going trick or treating in the British village. And most people didn't know what to do with that. <laughs> yeah. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. Halloween is the best. Yeah. yeah. So they got, they got a lot of tea. <laughs> Absolutely. But tea is very important. I, I, you know, it mustn't, uh, mustn't underestimate the power of tea. Yeah. Uh, you just go into the, uh, into the cupboards and be like, I don't know. What do we give the yeah, Americans? Yeah. Well, uh, tea bags and some Cadbury candy. Like, yeah. Uh, here in the UK, we refer to it as education. Cakes. That's what it is. Education, oh. that's what that is. Uh, cakes, yeah. <laughs> right. Our social media, if you'd like to get in touch with the show, you can send us a WhatsApp. It is plus four four seven five seven two two four nine one six six. That is the WhatsApp number. And I think most of the team now has access to that. So feel free to get your messages in. We have had a few problems with it recently, but it is up and r- running again now. Uh, also, email, uh, get in touch with the show. If you want to come to our 400th event, you need to get in touch. Send Send us an email. It's podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. It's podcast at plaintalkinguk.com. And Armando and Megan, you are both hopefully going to be there. We are. At That's the, the plan. That's the plan. That is the plan. That's the plan, right. as long as you don't shut your doors to us Americans. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah, let's, 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 let, know, yeah, let, let's stay, stay well away from that subject, I think, at the moment. <laughs> and uh, the website where you can find uh, details on how to find Patreon and things like that, go to our website, www.plaintalkinguk.com. If you want to, you can find out a little bit more about our hosts as well. Also, information about how to get onto things like our social media are there as well and uh, if you want to do it directly search social media for plain talking uk so uh, armando time to wrap up well i i mean we can't wrap up the show without uh, a <laughs> special thanks to our guest host megan who's filling Absolutely. in for carlos and nev yeah thank you you did a fine job um <laughs> thank you yeah thank you, thank for, you for the uh chat room you guys have been great thanks for the questions uh, it's been a wonderful week everybody have a safe holiday here in the u.s and um well, just have a great weekend and enjoy the week. Take so, care, everyone. I'm we'll going to s- go to uh, Micah's house and have some food. He's cooking yeah. tonight. Is the he- chat room has divulged into talking about food again. Of course. <laughs> I mean, it, it wouldn't be a PTUK podcast with, without that. But anyway, on that bombshell, let's say goodnight, everyone, and we'll see you all next week. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Bye. Good night.